Although the evidence for climate change is growing stronger by the day, the pressures on the world economy are equally unrelenting. The financial crisis that began in 2008 has not yet run its course. The global recovery is still very fragile, and what happens in the Eurozone could shatter it again. Economic problems have driven political change. In Europe alone, nine governments have fallen since the crisis struck, and people are losing uh, the faith in our ability to work together to solve the big problems. And that really matters uh, for climate change, because unless we can show that multilateralism works, I don't think we'll be able to get the global agreement that we so badly need. Now, the good news is that today we are closer than ever. Countries have agreed that in 2015 we will aim to sign a global deal to limit emissions and curb climate change. This commitment is the primary achievement of the Durban meeting last year, which Christiana Figueres described as the most encompassing and furthest reaching conference in the history of the climate change negotiations. In a little over three years, we must set in train a change to the whole structure of the world economy, breaking the bond between carbon and growth, building the systems to support low carbon economies in the most advanced countries and low emission development in poorer countries. Right now, everyone is focused on stability and growth, and so my first point is clear, the green economy can be good for both. Now, I'm hardly the first person to say that. Quite a few politicians have got there before me. But what's good news is that businesses are increasingly saying that too. At last, uh, last month's summit, all the G20 countries recognised the importance of putting green growth at the heart of their structural reform policies. So by this time next year, there will be 33 countries with national emission trading schemes. More than half the world's countries have renewable energy targets. And this governmental ambition is not just matched by businesses, it is surpassed. When it comes to pursuing sustainable growth, businesses are actually way ahead of governments. And they're looking to ministers in governments across the world to give them the certainty they need to invest in a clean energy future. To provide clear and predictable policies that can unlock investment at scale. So we cannot be drawn into some false choice between economy and the environment. Instead, we must be clear-eyed and hard-nosed about the case for green growth. And actually, that means making a better argument about the time horizons. But if we've learned anything in the last few months about, if I've learned anything in the last few months about energy and climate change policy, is that time horizons are long, decades, not days. But in a distracted world, it's easy for ministers to focus on the urgent at the expense of the important. But action on climate change is about both. We cannot let the search for short-term solutions threaten our long-term goals. And economic recovery that exposes to greater climate risk is, by definition, unsustainable. And partly, this is about looking to a different horizon, making sure that our efforts to build a more sustainable economy in the UK and in Europe lead to a financial sector, for example, that looks beyond the next quarter and invests in long-term growth. I want us to secure a greater share of that vibrant and growing sector. Not because I'm a hair-shirted hippie or bound by ideology, but because I believe in following the evidence. The green business generated a trade surplus for the UK of £5 billion last year. And if we play it right, and this is CBI figures, we could halve our trade deficit before the next election. Too often we are told that those who go low carbon first will sacrifice their competitiveness. I think that is misleading and dangerous. The real danger is not going green, but being outpaced by our competitors. Around the world, the countries who are most competitive are the ones who are investing the most in low carbon. And the real engine of sustainable growth is going to be green business. Over a third of the UK's economic growth in 2011-2012 is likely to come from green business, which now accounts for 8% of UK GDP. The way we can uh, assist developing countries by incentivizing and working with them in partnership and we've got increasing signs that they, those sorts of projects are helping. One of the, the examples that I, I quote and sometimes get in trouble for is pointing out how uh, the massive reduction in the cost of solar energy in recent, in recent times, in the last year or two, uh, has huge potential for 
uh, developing countries. Um, uh, the, particularly when you think of rural areas, uh, off-grid, uh, the ability for them to uh, generate uh, uh, power uh, is, uh, and, and improve their overall performance because of the increased likelihood that solar can, can, can be affordable for them, I think is really significant. And the one, one example that's been brought to my attention is that uh, uh, quite often people use, uh, have to import things like kerosene and paraffin. And if you look at the cost of a kerosene lamp, uh, which is obviously c costly for them to pay for the, uh, the, the, the materials and has a naked light, there's dangers, it gives off flames. You compare that to a solar lamp, the payback period now uh, is just six weeks. So for six weeks money for a kerosene lamp, you can now pay for a solar lamp. Uh, and while six weeks actually is a long, long time for someone who's in subsistence, nevertheless it shows the potential uh, that if we work with developing countries, we can unlock so much uh, and the new technologies are giving us that opportunity.